Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. Where are children serving as child soldiers, often against their will and a direct violation of their human rights? What is the United Nations doing to help extricate these children from this terrible situation? We'll be back in just a moment to talk about these and other important issues. The life of a child soldier is certainly a difficult one, and today we're focusing attention on child soldiers, how they got into the situation, and what the United Nations is doing to help get them out of it. My guest today is someone who's worked in this field for the past several years. Ms. Radhika Kumaraswamy was appointed as Special Representative for Children in Armed Conflict in April of 2006 by former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan, and then reappointed by the current UN Secretary Ban Ki-moon in February of 2007. Ms. Kumaraswamy, a lawyer by training and formerly the chairperson of the Sri Lankan Human Rights Commission, is an internationally known human rights advocate. Ms. Kumaraswamy, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Thank you. I appreciate you being with me. Let's talk about the First off, your position. What, as a special representative, uh, what exactly do you do, and when were you established, and why were you established? Well, you know, in the 1990s, when there was um, um, just a proliferation of conflict, especially internal conflict, especially in Africa, uh, and the children, there were visible signs of child soldiers and women, child, girls uh, resulting in sexual violence against girls. The UN asked Grasa Michelle, Nelson Mandela's wife, to write a study on children in armed conflict, and she did, a global study. Now, because of that study, the UN decided to appoint at the highest level, uh, USG, as they say, to deal with this issue of children in armed conflict, a uh, result of the outrage they felt uh, with regard to child soldiers. So my job is to be an independent moral voice on this issue, uh, to raise and advocate for it, to facilitate a UN system-wide response to this issue. Um, that's also very important for, for us. Uh, and also uh, to uh, monitor and report on violations, especially uh, to the Security Council. Mm -hmm. Very good. Now, before we get into it a little deeper, uh, tell us exactly what is, who is a child soldier? What is a child soldier? Is it a certain age range? You have males and females, or both, I assume, more males. But who would it be a, a child soldier, a typical child soldier? Well, I think we, we now prefer to use this term children associated with armed groups. So we can kind of uh, deal with them in this victim concept rather than to say that they're soldiers uh, uh, in that sense. So the UN now uses that term, children associated with armed groups. Mm -hmm. And basically these are children who are either abducted or enticed uh, to join uh, fighting forces. And they're under the age of 18 is what we monitor. Uh, and um, they are made, to, they're in the forefront of fighting or they may assist the fighting force in some way. Um, that are spies, messengers, uh, even uh, sometimes domestic chores, but that are related to them as a fighting unit. So these are the children. Um, uh, as you know, we had uh, the child soldiers of what we call the traditional African wars of Sierra Leone and Liberia. They were basically abducted from their homes, taken and then made uh, to fight, uh, and often with the help of drugs. These are the horrendous cases that we had, especially in the 90s. But now we have uh, a changing nature of conflict and we're having a new kind of child soldier, the worst manifestation of it being child suicide bombers, uh, where uh, you have children being enticed uh, by sort of heroic death and romantic notions of, of uh, either religion or ethnic group. So they join the fighting force and then are used. Um, that's a little different from the Liberia and Sierra Leone context. Now, there have been literally hundreds of thousands of young people who have been forced into these working, being associated with uh, groups, armed groups. 
and especially males, and of course a large number of them have lost their childhood. Mm. So they, they were carrying AK-47s and were mm. killing people. What, uh, what types of incentives are there to motivate governments and rebel groups and the children to return, to help get these children out of this situation and to return to a normal existence? What types of uh, incentives are out there to, to help get them out of this very difficult situation? Well, one of the things we feel mm -hmm. is that holding um, uh, perp the commanders and perpetrators accountable uh, will, we hope, serve as a deterrence. So one of the things uh, uh, with ICC, for example, the first case they brought was uh, has been a case with regard to the recruitment of child soldiers, the Thomas Dubanga case. Mm -hmm. But also we've been working with the Security Council. Uh, and what we do is we name parties that actually recruit and use children uh, as, uh, as uh, soldiers. And uh, these parties, th there's the threat of sanctions against them. So then that's an incentive, we hope, for them to enter into an action plan with the UN to get these children released and reintegrated. So we hope the deterrence power of sanctions and criminal prosecution will make commanders uh, come to terms. But we also have to deal with the root causes in a general way. Uh, and uh, work with the communities uh, to create kind of child protection networks so that people get are aware of this kind of uh, violation, protect their children from, uh, from this kind of recruitment. Mm -hmm. Also to protect schools so that children don't get recruited from schools. Mm -hmm. These are some of the things we can do. Mm -hmm. Now you referenced a name and shame list. Uh, how many countries or groups are on this uh, shame, uh, the list of shame? And can countries graduate off of it? Could they get off? Yes. Well, we have a uh, we have uh, about 53, I think, parties, uh, but the uh, majority are non-state actors. We actually, because of the shame list, most governments have entered into action plans with us. Uh, and have got off the list. Now, Uganda is a case. They, they used to have child soldiers in the Ugandan army, especially in the north. They entered into an action plan, uh, um, released children. We also then went and verified by doing visits and things in their camps to make sure that they did not have children, and they were then delisted. And now they are one of our uh, major um, uh, partners uh, in fighting the LRA and others. So there are s such success stories uh, with regard to governments. We also have non-state actors that have gotten off the list. Uh, we have uh, we had five earlier in Cote d'Ivoire that got off the list. And we're in the process of uh, dealing with uh, parties in the Philippines, the MILF and the Maoists in Nepal, who we hope will get off the list soon. So there are incentives that are out there to help. Do we have a ballpark figure of how many, uh, I, I keep saying child soldiers, I, this is a new concept, but ch uh, children who are associated with uh, violent groups or uh, yes. that type of thing, the new term that you're using, but uh, do we have a ballpark figure of how many there are today as opposed to maybe five, ten years ago? Well, I think what happened is five, ten years ago, we estimated it as about 250,000 uh, or so. Uh, but now we really have no sense of the figures because, as I said, of these new wars in Somalia and Afghanistan where we have no access to the interiors, where we can even make an assessment. We know there are a large amount of uh, children when they come as combatants and when, they, um, when people uh, meet them in combat or, or, or when they defect. But we can't assess the scale. So now we can't really give a figure, um, uh, especially in light of these new conflicts. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure many of our viewers would like more information on this very important topic, and they can go to www.un.org slash children slash conflict and tie into some very interesting information that you have. Now, you recently made a trip, or well, you made two trips, I guess, one to Chad and one to Afghanistan, two very volatile areas of the world. What were the purposes of your trips, and what were some of the outcomes? Well, for both trips, I went as part of those incentives you were talking about, to enter into an action plan with the government to release children and to allow the UN to access to their military installments for verification that there are no children uh, in those camps and to take those children into reintegration programs. Uh, so uh, when we went to Afghanistan uh, because we had allegations that there were children associated with the Afghan police. 
And so we approached the government. They were initially not happy to be listed. Nobody likes to be listed. And then, of course, we showed them the proof, pictures, and things like that. And then, But then I must say they responded very positively, and uh, we entered into an action plan. We also talked to the trainers, such as the U.S. and others who train Afghan forces to set vetting procedures to make sure that, that there are no children uh, coming into the, uh, to the uh, training camps. Uh, and also in Afghanistan, there's this practice called Bachabazi, which is that our army commanders, along with warlords, uh, have uh, boys who are often abducted and made into uh, dancing boys, uh, sort of, um, and also sexually exploited. So we hope that if we had access to the barracks and other places, that we can also try and uh, clear this practice. Do you find that a lot of the people that you talk to, and you talk to some very tough people in the world, some very dangerous characters from time to time, do you find that they're often not aware of what they're doing, that this has just been sort of part of the culture, or this is the way things have been, or maybe we're fighting a war, our group, our rebel group's fighting the government, or the government's fighting the rebel group, and everybody has to participate, and do you find that they, they, it opens their eyes when they realize that, not in every case, but in many cases, that not everybody views the world the way they view it? Yes, in men, there are groups that, that do say that they did not know that children under 18 should be recruited and that they're in their culture, there's a warrior uh, culture and that they should uh, uh, they recruit. And then these groups uh, are more likely to sign an action plan once they're made aware. Um, and there are others who claim that for ethnic survival, everybody in the community must fight children, women, uh, mm -hmm. everything. These are some of the arguments uh, that are made. But often it's just ruthless commanders, because in the same war you will find that some mm -hmm. recruit and some don't. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it's people that really don't, don't see the consequences for their children to mm -hmm. do this. Mm -hmm. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is an independently produced program. The views expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. We'll be back in just a moment after this important message. Hey, this is Edward Norton for the United Nations. Here's a question for you. If you had to choose, would you rather give up one of your lungs and take away all clean water from your kids or pay a little more for a shrimp cocktail and a cheeseburger? Sounds kind of obvious, right? But incredibly, every year, we as a global community are making the wrong choice, the foolish choice, to sacrifice our health and the health of our kids and our future by destroying millions of acres of the world's forests every year to support non-essential industries like cheap beef, shrimp, and palm oil production. Now most people, especially if they live in a big city like I do, wouldn't say that their life depends on a forest or on trees, but it does. Without large healthy forests on this planet, we would literally have no oxygen to breathe, no clean water to drink, much less food to eat, and almost no medicines to heal us when we're sick. Now, it's time we get our priorities straight. The UN has declared this the International Year of Forests. Join me in calling on our leaders to protect our planet's forests and our future health from the ravages of unsustainable industry. Don't think that you can't make a difference. You can. To find out what you can do, go to www.un.org forests. Thanks a lot. Welcome back to our program. Today we're taking a look at the situation with child soldiers, young people who are sometimes forced into serving with military groups or groups that are engaged in conflict. My guest is someone who's very knowledgeable of this situation. Ms. Radhika Kumaraswamy was appointed as Special Representative for Children and Armed Conflict in 2006 by former Sec UN Secretary General Kofi Annan and then reappointed by the current Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. Ms. Kumaraswamy, we're talking about the plight of child soldiers and the situation that they find themselves in. One of the most famous, and I, I keep using this term child soldiers only because I'm, I'm used to it, but one of the most famous, I guess, is Ishmael Bea, mm. who wrote a very interesting book, a memoir, on his experience mm -hmm. of being forced into working with the government of Sierra Leone at mm -hmm. that time. Have you had a, uh, what, what was Ishmael's story, just very briefly, or? Well, Ishmael has, is, works very closely with our office. Uh, oh, he does? Yes, okay. he's part of a network of uh, former children formerly associated with armed groups that we have 
who help us in our advocacy called NIPOR. Um, so they're a dynamic group of young people, and he's one of them. He's the leader, in fact. Uh, so Ishmael's story is really related to the war in Sierra Leone, where he was, um, uh, he and his, uh, after an attack on his village, he had to escape and then survive on his own and was uh, taken into one of the armed groups there. And, and he describes absolutely in detail the horrific things that were done to him and that he had to do. It's really quite heartbreaking and quite shocking when you actually read because he doesn't spare you mm -hmm. that. But to me, the most interesting part was, uh, was, uh, was after when they were about to be rescued. For example, that when UNICEF came in, they were, they were seen as civilians. I said, who are these civilians who are coming? And then they, they were horrified to find that they were these military me young men who now, even though they were 14 and 15, saw themselves as soldiers, were now being handed over to the civilians in light blue t-shirts called UNICEF. And then they were taken off. Uh, and then what they did was they, they thrashed the building. They were so furious. And it was only after working with them that they realized that they were victims and well, how much they had suffered and what, that the things that were being done to them needn't be done, that these are, this is not the normal life of a child. Mm -hmm. uh, and that realization, that transformation that he describes so beautifully in the book is really worth reading. Mm, it certainly is. The Memoir of a Child Soldier is really an excellent book, yeah. very compelling. You, it's a quick read and you don't want to put it down. Well, you mentioned about the reorientation and uh, talking about the children who have been extricated from, these, from this horrific situation. And you mentioned UNICEF, the UN Children's Fund as one of your key partners. How does that operate? When the children come out, they go into a, a sort of a reorientation program because a lot of them have lost their social skills. They really have known nothing but violence and killing people or maiming people. But how does that program work as far as helping the children to get back on track and to lead a normal life? Well, this is related to what happened to Ishmael. So they, basically, uh, UNICEF, uh, I think, and other child protection partners who are, uh, you know, like Save the Children and others who have worked with former uh, for children associated with armed groups, they have put forward something called the Paris Principles, which are best practices on how to deal with these children. And the fundamental aspect of the uh, Paris uh, Principles is that you have to deal with the child, with his family, and in the community. So they don't, uh, they don't like these long kind of keeping them in institutions for a long time. They want to reunite them as quickly as possible with their families, and then work with the family and the community. Uh, through providing services to the community that the child can access. Because you don't want to give the services only to the child because the other children who didn't become soldiers or others would resent it. So you give mm -hmm. it to the community. Uh, you also provide psychosocial services so the parents can adjust. After all, this child who has been wielding a gun is now coming back into the family. Uh, and many of them do need uh, psychosocial support. Um, and UNICEF and our child protection partners would really like to work with them over a period of two years, if possible, I think, mm -hmm. uh, to be able to do that successfully. And of course, there's real need for resources for that. Right. It, it seems like it would be a, a tremendous challenge to not only to UNICEF and to you mm -hmm. and to the child, really, but after living six, eight years in the jungle, toting an AK-47, taking drugs, a lot of them used immense amounts of drugs and that type of thing, that it would be a, a tremendous challenge to re-socialize and to get back into a family setting or a community setting. It is difficult. And uh, actually, Ishmael's book describes that in detail. But now he's such a wise and, and, and extraordinary young man. So it means that it can happen if you give them the right uh, uh, access. To him, he always argues it's education uh, that's mm -hmm. key. Uh, and that's what made the transformation for him, both first in, in uh, Sierra Leone and then afterwards here. And we also feel that it, as many children as possible should be sent back to some school or education. Mm -hmm. But if they're too old and if, they, if it's not possible, then of course they should be given livelihood training uh, and other things they can access uh, as adults. Mm -hmm. Now you have a considerable amount of information on your website, un.org slash children slash conflict that our viewers can go to and learn much more about this very important topic or they can google child soldier and a lot of information will come up yes. but it's a very important topic and it's one we don't hear a lot about and hopefully we'll hear a lot more about in the future as as you look at what you you've been doing this now 
uh, for the past several years. As you look at the, the, the operation, what do you see as some of the major obstacles uh, or challenges, I'll say, it, yeah. as you move forward? Because uh, are, is it financial challenges or getting governments to, to become more aware of this problem? Or what are some of the major challenges that you confront? Well, I think the first, uh, we have come a long way in setting the norms, setting the, you know, all that, the legal framework, the, the frameworks for how to do best practices, all that is written. Now it's really implementation. But to us, the challenges uh, really uh, are uh, in the changing uh, nature of war, um, how to deal with many things the UN is finding that it's at, at these uh, new, new conflicts and finding it difficult to, to do humanitarian work. And, you know, things like child suicide bombers, what do you do with them? How do you even begin to deal with that kind of phenomenon? Uh, the issue that more and more children are now in detention and, and before justice systems. And how do we handle that issue? We are arguing that we should try and rehabilitate them and not prosecute them, that they should be treated uh, uh, as, as victims. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, uh, reintegration to get the funding to get them back uh, home and, and, and po positively rehabilitated and reintegrated so that they don't get re-recruited or enter a life of criminality or something horrific and become a problem for the future. Uh, so these are some of the issues that we face. Mm -hmm. Now we've talked about a few of the challenges, but I'm sure you've, you've seen a lot of successes too. We talked about Ishmael Bea and the memoir of a child soldier, and Ishmael is certainly a success story without a doubt. He, mm -hmm. he has really done a phenomenal job and he's uh, working with you and with UNICEF but what are a couple of the success stories that you've seen or some of the unique experiences that you've encountered in talking with generals or field commanders or whatever the case might be? Well I think I think if we look uh, uh, and see from where we were in, in the 1990s when nothing was done on this there's been quite a lot of developments the Security Council has acted the International Criminal Court has acted the whole, as I said earlier, the frameworks have been developed, uh, and even for reintegration, the principles have been developed. And then even on the ground, every day you meet uh, things that have happened. Uh, Fifteen action plans have been signed with the various groups. And also just recently I was in Chad, and um, there was this uh, young man who was formerly with the Chadian rebel forces. He uh, had um, uh, been handed over to UNICEF as part of the action plan for rehabilitation. They had given the care the responsibility there to reintegrate him. So they had trained him uh, in, uh, in tailoring was what he liked best. And so now he is very talented in the sphere. So he, then they gave him a little money to set up a, a shop. And now he runs the shop, and he was very and he was very proud because a lot of the ministers he's very talented. Ministers' wives and all come to him for for their clothing, so that's another success story we can add to some of the others that we see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's not all gloom and doom. There's no, there's and also, a lot of good news out and there. And the thing is, the, the children suffer terribly, <laughs> but their resilience and their ability to fight back and and if they're given the right uh, support and incentives is, is truly remarkable. It's a testament to the human spirit. Mm, it certainly is, yes. Now, you produce reports uh, when you go on trips like to Chad, Afghanistan, and are these reports online? Are they at your website, or uh, can people access them? Is that possible? Well, the trips, we don't do it. We, it's not a fact-finding. Uh, mm -hmm. um, if it is a fact-finding mission, it is online. But what we do is we have a whole monitoring and reporting system in each of these countries that produces reports for the Security Council. Uh, so there's one on Chad, there's one on Afghanistan, which details all the violations against children in the countries. And that can be accessed at the website. So those are the reports we really produce uh, for the Security Council and also for the Human Rights Council and the General Assembly. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned that you're, you're networking with the Secretary General of the Security Council, and the General Assembly, and you mentioned the International Criminal Court. Uh, what, how do you interact with that group? Well, the International Criminal Court recently, as you know, the first case that they put forward was the case of Thomas Lubanga, who was this young, uh, who was this man who was recruiting children. And then um, what happened was when they, uh, what we did was we filed an amicus curiae uh, to argue how to define child 
soldiers or recruitment and enlistment. So we've been working uh, with them, uh, with the court and that, and they will give a judgment in the November. But what was interesting in this case was with the first child witness that was brought before the case, they took one look at Lubanga and they retracted everything. They said, oh, no, no, we, we didn't do anything. He was a wonderful man and all this. Um, and so that was our first test case of a child witness before international tribunal. And then realizing how much we have to work with them and coach them before they come before uh, international tribunals to give witness against those who recruit with them. But we work closely with the court because uh, our purpose is to try and develop for the first time after this Lubanga, there will be international jurisprudence on the whole issue. So we want to make sure that it covers all the, top, all the issues of concern for children and is interpreted in the best light. Well, this is certainly a very important area that you're dealing with, a special representative for the United Nations uh, for Children in Armed Conflict. And again, it's one that we, as I mentioned, we really need to learn a lot more about it because it, it's impacting these children and it's, it's really it's, uh, for the sake of humanity, for the sake of, uh, of defending the human rights and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights for people all around the world. And these children certainly have theirs, and they're being violated at this, at this particular point in time. But Ms. Radhika Kumaraswamy, I want to thank you so thank very you. much thank for a very, very much. interesting and a very informative program. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us on today's Global Connections program.